in GIS with a coastal application. Um, and one of the things that we've been working on with the state and FEMA is doing a lot of outreach to the public. And what that entails, you know, um, is really informing everyone on the new product that FEMA is putting out, um, which entails risk map. Um, a lot of the coastal analysis have really updated a lot of the analysis that have been going on because, as you know, a lot of maps have been out, have been out for about 30 years now. So it's really needed, and a lot of the, the maps are not reflecting reality as we've seen it. Um, just to give you an outline of today's session, we're going to have two sessions. Um, first session A, we're going to talk about Hurricane Sandy. Actually, Bill McDonald from FEMA Region 2 is here. He's going to be giving a, um, a little presentation on that um, in the beginning of, of session A. And then we're going to be talking about our overview of the coastal mapping, the scientific research involved in the new study, um, storm surge modeling and the affected communities. And throughout this, we're going to try to have a couple group discussions, try to answer your questions, and try to hear from you to see what you've been doing in response to the storm. And then we're going to have a quick break. And then in session B, we're going to talk about what is risk map and the risk map product. Um, if, you are, if you're familiar with the map modernization project, risk map is an upgrade to that, you know, including new, pr new products like flood depth grids and limit of moderate wave action in, in coastal areas. Um, we're also going to be talking about the public's role in flood maps. Um, the revision process, and um, the revision timeline, so you'll actually get to see when these maps are going to be coming out and effective. And we're going to open a group discussion to everyone online as well as in the room today. So, the purpose of this webinar, provide information to you, um, stakeholders, stakeholders, business owners, um, and also the public. People who live in this area, especially following Hurricane Sandy, have been extremely affected by this storm event. And these maps are changing a lot in these areas. So it's really important to inform the public of the risk that's involved with these storm events. So we're going to be talking about post Hurricane Sandy, the new advisory based flood elevation, the new flood insurance study, um, which has a lot of science behind what's going on in the state and why a lot of the zones have changed since the last map and the new flood insurance rate map. So the objectives, FEMA post-Hurricane Sandy effort. We're going to be talking about the advisory-based flood elevation, the flood risk study, the risk map program. Risk map is very important to this whole process and all the products that are going to be provided to all the communities to convey risk to all of your community members. And coastal mapping is a huge part of that. So we're going to be talking about the introduce the research and modeling. We're going to introduce all the data sets and products, especially associated with risk map and the public's role in the risk map process, or the revision process. And we're trying to promote community engagement. Um, previously, community engagement, um, it wasn't such a approach where everyone's trying to hand out web do these webinars and try to actually go to the public and talk to people. Um, we're, we're here to help FEMA and the state to convey this information. Come in, guys. Um, with that said, I'm going to hand this over to Bill McDonald. Um, he's going to be talking about Hurricane Sandy and the flood hazard information um, needed. Good morning, everybody. Um, first, let me introduce myself, give you a little background on me. Um, I'm a retired New Jersey State Trooper for 25 years, and during that time, I spent 10 years or so in the Office of Emergency Management. Mm -hmm. During that time, I was a state coordinating officer, so I managed disasters for probably the last five years of my career. Nothing of this magnitude, all right? But just so that you're aware and keep this in perspective, this is the second largest catastrophic event in the nation has ever happened, second to Katrina. So we realize the, the impact it's having on, on your communities, uh, U.S. public officials, and on your residents. Um, so what we're trying to, to do as much outreach as we can uh, with FEMA. Well, now that I'm with FEMA, um, I'm their outreach specialist. I do all of the risk map outreach that uh, Dan referenced. Plus, when it comes to a disaster, right now I'm the Deputy Branch Director for Mitigation um, and assisting in, in the recovery. Um, <laughs> you can just follow along on there. If you don't mind, I, I like to walk around this one. Um, the state and local officials, I mean, you face tough
tough decision, all right? And we're here to help you with that. We realize that we are putting you in a, in a position that is, is very difficult. You have to make decisions in, in what we call risk communication, telling your residents, all right, what their risk is and understanding that they are going to push back because you may get pushed back in several different ways. One, well, we didn't flood in this event. So why are you now telling me you're putting us in a B zone from an A zone? And in fact, worst case scenario, with our new uh, regulatory products, we may be putting people from that were never in a special flood hazard area into a B zone. And the reason why that happens is not just arbitrarily or contrary to what people think that we're just trying to get people into the special flood hazard area, pay more flood insurance, and, and fix the National Flood Insurance Program because it's running in a deficit. That's not, not why. The reason is, is that we have better science, better data, better technology to identify those risks. Maybe those risks, the people were always at risk, it's just that it wasn't truly reflected on, on the map. Some of the maps that you're dealing with in your community might be from the 1980s. So you're dealing with not necessarily the science from the 1980s, you might have been dealing with the science from 10 years, five, 10 years prior to that, because the regulatory process takes about five, seven years for us to update a map. So the science, obviously, maybe from the 70s and 80s, isn't what it is today. That's why we're able to identify a better and, and more accurate risk. Uh, property owners with damages to destroy property face major decisions as well. As Dan will, will talk about later this afternoon, the risk map that he's talking about, it's, it's an ongoing process. We've been dealing with the state of New Jersey for the last two years on our outreach. And I, I, and I have to commend uh, the, the partnership that we've had. FEMA in the past, when they have to put out these regulatory products, all right, they've done it behind closed doors. They've done it in a silo. They developed it. Not that necessarily the science wasn't good and they weren't doing it accurate. It's just that they did it in a bubble. And then when they presented it to the community, it was shocked. But it was already too late for any input, suggestions, appeals, things of that nature. What they decided to do is develop an outreach program where we involve the community officials. Not just the community officials, but all of our partners, our technical partners, Johnson Stowe, Monmouth University, Rutgers University, um, Stockton, all of our, our technical partners along the way. So as we develop this data, we're bouncing it off a technical panel so that they can check for accuracy, give us that input, so that we're fixing it as we go along, getting that, that technical support as we go along. And then we also have people assisting us with outreach, right? Lisa is the, the chair of our, co our coastal advisory uh, team here in the state of New Jersey, and they are developing the outreach and assisting us with getting the word out uh, as broadly as possible. Um, I saw in the, in the previous slide, Dan said about getting community engagement. People refer to these maps as FEMA's map, all right? They're really your map. They're your community's map. They're your residents' map. It's there. You, you need to take ownership in these because they are your risk. It is how you at the community level plan uh, at the local level, yeah. plan for rebuilding um, and yeah. how you're going to work in your community. So that's why we need community engagement, is so that you know your risk and how you're going to plan in the future. The existing flood insurance rate maps do not reflect the current coastal flood risk. As I said, we're dealing with the 1970 and 1980s products, right? The, the data that we have now is obviously more advanced more technical, and it's obviously better science. Um, some of the decisions made today can help provide for a safer, stronger future. If we waited, as the federal government, if we waited until our regulatory products went effective, right? and the way the regulatory product goes is you're going to be getting a, a preliminary product in the summer of this year. There's a regulatory process, appeal, comment, uh, posting in the National Register, and then allowing uh, six months for the communities to adopt. You're talking that year 18 months after it goes prelim, before it goes effective. When it goes effective is when the insurance implications and everything else kick in. If we waited until then to provide the information that we have available now, you as communities couldn't make informed, intelligent decisions on how you're going to rebuild right now. This is when you need the information. That's why we came out with these advisory products. They're a non-regulatory product. Now that the governor's adopted them, they are law here in the state of New Jersey. So that's why we provided that information. Whatever information we had to us, we didn't have everything, 
But what we had, we wanted to share, all right? And what we had was the vertical elevation, all right? And then that's what you'll see as your BFEs and BFEs. And we also provided our best estimate on the horizontal zone, the B zone, the A zone, things of that nature. Um, we didn't have time to run our WAFIS model because that's a, an ongoing process. It's running parallel to what we're doing right now, which we show you how far in the B zones go based on wave action. So we took a very conservative measure on, on the zone. So when those products come out, right, this is probably worst case scenario on the advisory for your planning for worst case scenario. So that when we do our WAFIS modeling and shows the, the bulkheading, the buildings, the structures that can stop a wave action, that V-zone may shrink, all right? But if you build to the V-zone standards that you're in now, you'll obviously be safer, stronger, and more resilient. So we just wanted to make sure that we provided worst case scenario. All right, what are our advisory base All right, it, it is a modeling that's consistent with what we do for our regulatory product, right? And it's all based on the 1% annual camp uh, that you can flood at that elevation. Did you try to call in or buy yes. an announcement? Uh, people joining us uh, via telephone, could you please mute your phones? It's very hard to hear. There's a lot of echo. Sorry. No, that's okay. And it's at the 1% annual chance. And, and we're trying to get away from that, the old terminology, the 100-year flood. Right, because it's confusing to the to the residents, to the community. You know, they, they take it literally. All right, if, if they haven't flooded in 30 years, they think they're good for another 70. All right, so what we're trying to do is get away from that terminology. It's the one percent annual chance, the hundred year, the special flood hazard area. It's all the same terminology. It means all the same thing to me, maybe to most of you. All right, but when you're speaking to residents, they literally take it as a hundred year flood. So if they didn't flood. 30 years, they think they're good for another 70. So we're trying to get back to that 1% annual chance so that every year they understand that they have a 1% chance of flooding at or above the 100-year flood base base elevation. Um, and they reflect the higher, higher CFE. So as I said, we're, we're conservative. So our, B, our advisory information is probably either going to be right on or a little higher, more more conservative than when our regulatory products do come out. And as it says here, the zones do extend further inland, and that's because we didn't run our WAPIS model. We didn't take into consideration anything that would dissipate slow down wave action. Okay, our region2coastal.com website. We created this prior to Sandy so that we can put out our regulatory products. Again, being a little more proactive, um, it's very hard for residents and community officials to actually read the regulatory product. And, and I, I have a hard time reading the old firms. I mean, you, it's just a big gray map to me. But when you go on this site here, all right, it, it's really um, technologically friendly to everyone. So we were going to have our regulatory products up here anyway. We already had the structure built, the technological structure built. So when, Her when uh, Hurricane Sandy hit, it was just easy for us to transition right in, create another tab, the Hurricane ta uh, Sandy tab, and start building out our recovery from there. So if you go to this site, and, and just to let you know how successful it's been, and by us getting the word out and, and all of our partners, we have probably around 400,000 hits to this site since Hurricane Sandy. And I would say more than half are returners to the site, and specifically all to the ABFE um, site to see what their old and current elevation and zone is versus what the new ABFE is. So we've been getting great hits on there. Also on this site, we have Ask the Expert. So if someone has a question, it could be you. Anybody can go on this site and ask the question, resident, anybody affected by it. Ask the Expert, you ask the question. We have staff dedicated to that. They respond to your question, you know, as, as quickly as possible. So we, we also are, are taking care of that. It's, it's just another way of getting out to the, to the community. But if you were to go in there, and you, if those of you that aren't familiar, you click on Sandy, you can go right down to what is my ABFE. Go in, put in your address, and it'll be a Google map type picture with a flag on your, on your property, and it'll say what your current ABFE is, 
what your zone is, and then what you were. All right? And what we try to stress to people, again, the, the, un, the unknown is what scares people. So if, you, if they're not familiar with the terminology and what we're dealing with, someone may log on there and say, okay, my ABFE is 10 feet. I have to elevate 10 feet? No. That's what we're suggesting the ABFE is. We don't know what your current lowest adjacent grade is or your lowest horizontal member in your home is. That's just the advisory based flood elevation. You have to determine what your physical structure is, where you are at right now. If it's 10, you already may be at 8. So you may only have to go up two if you do have to elevate. And that's some of the fear that we're trying to eliminate from the, from the communities is once they see that, that big number, they think they have to go up 10 feet. All right? So if we could also assist the community when we speak to, to residents, uh, that's important. All right, floodplain management. I, I know all of your floodplain managers right now are in a day, probably hiding because <laughs> they have a big, big responsibility. And some of your communities, your floodplain manager may also be your code enforcement officer, may be a whole several different hats, wear several different hats in your community. Right now, whoever that person is needs to wear that floodplain manager's hat because it, it, it's very important to your community and how you're going to recover um, and whether or not you're going to be successful in, in doing that. So that, that floodplain manager is very, very important. As you know, the state adopted the ABFE, it is still the, still the suggestion that the communities adopt as well the ordinance and how they're going to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure on, on the implications, Joe, and I don't know how that works with the state, but it's my understanding since the state adopted the ABFE, the communities, when they go and get their permits, they have to still go through the State Department of Environmental Protection and they, they can't be less restrictive than the state when they're getting their permit. So that's a, an issue there. So that's something you might want to be uh, concerned about. Um, and when, when we provide our, our final firm that replace the ABFE, that is when your insurance implications will take effect. There are no insurance uh, implications on the advisory product. So no insurance implications until probably sometime in 2014 when our maps go effective. All right. That's based off of this. One caveat to that. The new Bigger Water National Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012, which went into effect January 1st of this year. The intent of that legislation, which again, when you talk about a perfect storm, it couldn't have been a worst case scenario for us. All right. We had the storm. We're coming out with new flood insurance rate maps and then Congress passes this new bigger waters legislation, all right? People think it's a, it's a result of this storm. None of them are related, all right? It's just ironic that we're all coming together. Some pros and some cons to that, all right? The pros to it is there is a lot of grant money available, a lot of disaster assistance money available, ICC money available to help those affected rebuild safer storm and more resilience to the new codes and standards. If we didn't have this disaster, none of those monies and funding would be available. So it would have been even a bigger shock if they found out when the maps went effective that now they are minus four and non-compliant in their zone. At least now they have the information and have time before the insurance education takes effect. The first subsidy that's removed as a result of that legislation note is for non-primary residents. So even though the, the legislation took effect January 1st this year, it's not until that policy renews. So when that policy renews, whenever it is, it could be in August. If it's a non-primary resident, you will, your subsidy will be removed. Doesn't mean that you go from, if you're paying $1,000 in flood insurance right now, and the anticipated actuarial rate, which I'm just throwing out numbers, all right, is 9,000. That doesn't mean you go from 1,000 to 9,000. There is an increase of 20 to 25 percent annually on whatever you're paying right now. So if you're paying 1,000 and it goes up 20 percent, then next year it could be 1,200, and it'll continue to go up until you get to that actuarial rate. All right. But please go back and, and get yourself familiar with that legislation because it does have other significant triggers and impacts to your residents. All right. If a property, if, if your 
residents allow their insurance to lapse, get frustrated, don't want to pay it no more, I quit, I'm out of the program, and then have to come back into the program and renew it. That is one of the triggers that makes them go from whatever they were paying to actuary. So that would be a case where if they allowed their policy to lapse and have to get what's referred to as a new policy, they would go right from that one in that older scenario from one to 9,000. No grandfathering, no phasing in, all right? So keep that in mind, all right? Convince them that they need to keep the policy, otherwise they lose that opportunity. And again, here, here are some of the, the implications to it. The one important thing here, all right, your, your floodplain managers, in addition to, to helping your community plan to rebuild, they also have, they are the only one in your community that can declare a, a structure substantially damaged. Substantially damaged is a structure that is damaged 50% or more as a result of this disaster. And it's just a structure. So an example is, is on your tax ID card, your card, it'll say what the structure is worth and what the property is worth. It's what the structure is worth. So if the structure is $100,000 and you've had $50,000 worth of damage, the flood insurance, um, the floodplain manager will declare that property substantially damaged. Again, pros and cons. If they're declared substantially damaged, they are required by law to now rebuild into compliance, whatever the new codes and standards are, which are the ABFD. All right. But they're also eligible for ICC money here, that $30,000, the increased cost of compliance, all right, up to $30,000 to bring that property back into compliance, elevation. It's not going to fund the whole thing, but between that and their fund insurance and other funding opportunities that may be available, you know, trying to make them as whole as possible. That's only available though if they have fund insurance. Yes. Yes, because... People look at the ICC money as free money, as a grant, right? Yeah. It's really not. It's, it's the people that have flood insurance are actually part of their premium goes towards this ICC. So they're paying all along. It's just something now that they're now eligible for. All right. So the people that are paying for it in their premiums are now entitled to up thirty thousand dollars. The max coverage for flood insurance is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Nothing can exceed that. So between the, the flood insurance award and the ICC, the max is 250000 So if they maxed out on their award for flood insurance, 250000 then they're not eligible for the ICC because the max they can give is two fifty. So if they were two hundred, then they're eligible for the extra thirty, two thirty, they're fine. As long as they don't exceed the two hundred and fifty thousand. So that's yes. per 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 occurrence, correct. Yes. Good question. All right, we've got a question. Uh, if building in an X and now in an A or a V, is it eligible for ICC if insured is at X? If they have a flood insurance, go ahead, Jack. I, I think if, if they're in an X and they were complying and, and now they're in A based on the A's and the B, would the community have to adopt also? Yes, the community would have to adopt. And, and again, just so that we're, we're clear here. Just because you were substantially damaged doesn't mean you're automatically entitled to that uh, ICC money. And it was good, again, another pro to adopting the ABFEs. If you were to rebuild at the current max, all right, and you were okay, you were compliant, you would not get the ICC money because there would be no reason to have an increased cost in order to comply. But now if you have to comply with the ABFE elevation, all right, now there is a, an, an increased cost in for you to come into compliance. So there, there's a good point, Jeff. Okay, uh, community implications that we have grants available and our hazard mitigation assistance grants program uh, are community-based. So the community has to apply on behalf of its residents and they can apply for several different things. They can apply for elevation, they can apply for acquisitions, retrofitting, waterproofing, things of that nature. They can actually apply for things in the community, all right, other type of mitigation measures that, that are eligible projects. And how they do that is they write a letter of intent right now, they're in the process of doing that to the state, through the county, identifying 
property that may be what their intent is, and then they will find out from the state um, if the grant has been awarded to them, right, and who's been selected. Then they need to go back and refine that because then they'll get a, a determination on probably how much money they'll get. So they may have good intentions of saying we're going to elevate a thousand homes, but the money, the award doesn't allow to fund that whole thing, so then they have to again make a tough decision on prioritizing which ones they're going to elevate. So again, there's a lot of tough decisions to be made at the local level. And all of our federal money is contingent on compliance with the ABFE. Right? So whether it's a grant or public assistance money, um, whatever whatever we're giving out is consistent with the ABFE. Is there a deadline for letter of intent? There is. That's up to the state. Joe, you know what the OEM is doing? Yes. Letter of intent is when it's due. I know it was due. It's due to the county. 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 It's the 4th of February. Yeah. In Ocean County, February 8th, but we wrote a letter Friday. It's going to be March 31st. We expect that. Okay. All right. And if there's any questions about that, that, that is dictated by the Office of Emergency Management at the state. So OEM, so if you have any questions or need extensions, make sure you go through that. So for the four four applications, if your community doesn't adopt them, even though the state has, you're not eligible? That's a good question. That is something I'm going to talk to you for a lot That's something we have to figure out. The hazard mitigation grant, as far as I know, as long as the project is compliant with the ABFE, the grant is eligible. We have ICC money. The ICC money has, has nothing to do with whether or not a community adopts. Well, no, no, it does. It does. Where with the existing map, you're compliant. Yeah. Right. That's what. Yeah. Yeah. Adopt in order not be compliant. If there is a difference in elevation, yes. But the, but the question is now, because the state is requiring, you know, it's weird. That, and, that's, and that's something that we have to figure out. How to figure out. It's an opinion that we've already asked of the state so that when we go out and message, it's clear because the state adopted it, but now what are the implications to the communities? Because it is mayor. So we don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Has, this, has, has other states adopted ABFE the way our state did across the board? The only other time that the ABFE is that Katrina in New Orleans, and they didn't come out for like six to nine months after the disaster. The problem yeah, I don't think they adopted it as a state, but they are you know, community by community. The ABFE New York is also getting ABFEs now, they're just coming out now. So this, we're in a unique situation. We should adopt it. What we're saying is that the community. Yeah, it makes sense. I would. Like he said, if you don't adopt, then the, uh, the ICC money is tied into that in regard to bringing them into compliance. Right. We, thought, we thought the state adopted that that made it all okay. And everybody gets the ICC yeah, money. Yeah, there may be some, some okay. areas where there, there might be some issues. Uh, but, but we've got to. You don't need to talk to us. You need to. The state needs to determine. Well, well, it's, it's really the insurance. You know, what what is the insurance thing to say? Are they going to accept that the state adopted it, or are they still going to look at? You know. I know our grants are not tied to whether or not the community adopts. That's the grant. Right. The ICC. Is the, Joe, is there a sample ordinance we can see? Yeah, yeah, I think we're 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 in, we're either putting that on the website or we're getting ready to put that on the website. Okay, great. Thanks. Yes, sir. Regarding individual property owners um, and the change from the old Reno maps to the new ABFE, is it the change in data? Does that mean that basically every structure is going to require a new flooding uh, elevation certificate resurvey? No. How do you go between the two data? The conversion? Yeah, the conversion? Well, there, there is a conversion of what, the 1.2? Yeah, it depends on where you're at. Yeah, it's it's a you know, it, it could vary throughout, throughout the coast. It could vary. It's, right. it's generally around the coast, but it's a bit, I don't know what, what, what would be the requirement to do that conversion. I think in the flood insurance studies, there, there, there's usually a formula. The ABSC map has that formula. The ABSC map has that formula. The accuracy of that is not. As precise as 
as to the uh, the secondary conditional variance, you know how when we're talking about principal foot, it's going to be critical. Okay, I'm, and we'll follow up if we. I'm taking notes here. Any other questions? These are questions on? that we're off logging, so we can always. I mean, it, the Merck on the website, mm -hmm. it does the conversion. I'm sure if being all accepted, if you go to the website and use the Merck from there, you know, if you go to the, your location, you can be last few months to use the whatever is version you know, the Merck on the website. That should be okay. I also. Holder says it's on the ADAP map. So, so do you think if they use the conversion on the map for the panel that they're in, that would be okay? Also, so that's another option. But it is something we'll follow up with the group. We'll get an answer back and then disseminate it back out to the group. I'm sure there's a sign in sheet that we can get to the, to the broader audience. All right, and then just you know, rebuilding the, the community back to be more resilient. That is the ultimate goal. Identify the risk. What is your true risk? And then how do we rebuild that community to be more resilient? Okay, these are some of the resources uh, available to you, all of our websites. Um, if you just go to our Region 2, the numeric number 2, coastal.com website, everything is on there. With all of the, the recommendations for rebuilding codes and standards, construction specifically for V zones. And we are right now trying to add material to that. Um, and, and the more information and feedback we get from your communities, and, and not just because he's in the room, but the, the mayor and Brick, they put on a, a, a fair for their people. They refer to it as a fair, and we were there all day providing information. I, we must have hit 2,000 people in one day, and that's the type of forum we're trying to hit. Instead of going you know, community by community and maybe getting 50, 80 people at a time, if we can get forums like that, and then Tom Driver duplicated that this Saturday, where again we hit you know over a thousand people. Those are the type of forums. If the communities can get together and maybe have one or several small communities, we're reaching more people more effectively, more efficiently. But all of the information is on the site. And then the feedback we get from the community officials and from the residents, if something's not on there, we add it. All right, we're dealing with, with the mayor and Tom Driver and Mayor and Brick. Some of the V code standards, you know, is it just pylons and piers? Well, that's what some of our recommendations are. But are there other options available? So we're right now researching that with our building science people, and there may be. So whatever we obtain from them, we're going to then put on the website so that information is available to you when you're responding to your residents on how they have to rebuild. Uh, flood insurance, you know, all of these websites are, are listed here, and they're also listed on the region2coastal.com. Another great uh, site is the uh, flood smart it gives you a lot of information it gives you some examples of the insurance you know what it may cost all right but again they're using generic broad numbers it's unique and specific to each policyholder so keep that in mind but what we are trying to do is create a, a program an app like we did for the ABFE you punch in your address tells you what your ABFE is and what your current map is what your current effective is we're trying to do that like they do for car insurance. Punch in a couple different criteria and it'll give you an estimate of what your insurance might be. We're still dealing with headquarters, still dealing with there because there's a lot of pushback on that because they don't want us to create something then then possibly can mislead someone. You know, they punch in, well, you said mine was only going to be 5,000 and now I got it and it's 9,000, but it's based on what you put in. But it, it, is, help, it is a very helpful tool that if you can punch in that information and let people know what's available to them. In addition to us, there's also the Small Business Administration, uh, SBA. Again, a lot of residents think, they hear the title of the organization, Small Business, they think it's only for businesses. They do provide loans for residents on their individual structures. And the more and more I hear them speak, it, it does sound like an, an, an excellent opportunity if nothing else is available to you. All right, Small Business Administration does provide not only um, funding, but mitigation-specific mitigation funding for, uh, for their structures. Is there, is there the deadline, I think, was just extended to March 1st, I believe. Question is brought up yep. from the fifth floor down, Hurricane Sandy Advisory Base Flood Elevation in New Jersey, New York. Right. And the comment was 
that the ABFEs weren't a result of Hurricane Sandy, and much that might be misleading. Okay, the advisory products that we produce for New Jersey and New York, all right, it's because we have an ongoing coastal study which impacts New Jersey, the coast of New Jersey, and the coast of New York. That was the coastal study that we have been working on for the last several years, which will be talked about in risk math. Okay, so Region 2 and FEMA is responsible for New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, so it is something that we as a region have been working on. And now that there is a declared disaster in the state of New York and a declared disaster in the state of New Jersey, well, again, we're working parallel. So there are going to be advisories in the state of New York, more specifically New York City and Westchester. Um, so they, they do have their products going on. But again, it is not a result of Hurricane Sandy. The information in there is not due to Sandy. We have taken high water marks, put them on the ABFE, but this has been a historical uh, collection of scenarios and storms, all right, that we've modeled and have come up with that 1% annual chance of merit. Uh, you know, I don't want to uh, ask too many questions on this, but... I would be disappointed if you didn't. <laughs> on, the, uh, you know, on the website, it says that, that these ABFEs and the polygons and the, and the high water mark Sandy were not used to draw these maps because Sandy was, as the website says, a greater than one year storm. 200 year storm, 300 year storm. If these maps are going to be a map of a 100 year storm, you, you can see without any hesitation at all that the, that the high water mark of Sandy was used in these maps. So I think either FEMA has to change what it said on there and just kind of say, yes, we're using uh, a 200 year event to map a 100 year uh, flood insurance map. That's the first one. So, so I think I ended up. The way the reason why that's confusing is we do map, and our modeling is based off, you know, the, the average, so it comes to a 1% annual chance. The, even though a, a Hurricane Sandy may have been a 200-year event in your area, may have been less than someone else's, may have been more, right? But even if it was a 200-year event in your area, you, you have to now add that into the hundreds of scenarios that we've already modeled, so it, it's not going to skew it very much either way. So the average that we've modeled is that 1% annual chance. So would you say then if that's the case to the modeling, would that map then that is by water mark of Sandy would be different in not be, I'm only concerned with really ocean county in the town, but in other areas that you're saying is the high water mark of Sandy would not be those other areas and, and would it be because it's modeled that's the path of the The second question on that is um, and that's something that when people appeal, I'm not sure they're going to use that as justification for you to change their own on that that now they're going to be. Just while we're talking about the map, you mentioned before that the WACA data data wasn't used. I know it's wave action, something like that. What does that say? Overland. It's an overland. Wave, 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 wave action at wave, that's wave, wave height analysis. Wave height analysis. Overland. Overland. Okay. So if the, that was not used in the map, the big concerns that we have from our uh, our residents do. It's going to be done for a final map. It's, it's, it's being done. That's why it's not in right I now. I understand. The problem is that people are in the now and so far up in the boom. Correct. You got to speak before everyone to say we can rebuild and everybody. It is probably twice as expensive to rebuild in a V than it is in an A. And sure. because they be maps are out, and they're out. Look, I'm glad we have ABFE. Mm -hmm. Not like we don't have B and A. I'm glad we have ABFE. Because I don't think anybody's had a problem with the elevation. They're concerned with how to rebuild. Stricter standard. Because right now, people have to wait until September to even think about rebuilding. Because many people, if they're still left in a B, are going to have to knock down their house. Because you're not going to be able to move it. So, is there any help you can give us? And I know Fox and Zoe said, you know, about a month before September, these, uh, when these uh, BMPs come out, that there'll be a working map that comes out because, you know, that is the biggest question that we have. And everybody's on hold right now for rebuilding. If you're in a seat, you've got to be crazy to rebuild it. So, so yeah, I mean, potentially with the losses modeling more detailed, we may have some shifts in those zones. So yeah, that's the best available information right now. And like I said, it's 
difficult because people want to make decisions. This is all we've got right now. So, yeah, once the preliminary maps come out, we're going to have a better idea of where everything is when we take some losses. We just have to wait. And yeah, so, I mean, that, that's it. I mean, you tell people if you can't wait, this is what's available. If you can wait, you may, you may be in a different zone. Here, here's the dilemma you know, here, you know, here, here's the dilemma they were in. Do we not provide that at all? Right. And leave it current. So, yeah, we'll give you the elevation, but we, we won't give you horizontal. So now you rebuild to that A, and then when that map was effective, you find out that now, even though your elevation's okay, um, you're a non compliant structure, and you're going to pay there. And, and you and I talked, and, and I think it was helpful for you. I'm not a doctor, I'm not an engineer. I did put it on the but for the sake of time, I think we're going to have to. All right, let me just give one thing that I think could be helpful if you're explaining. The law of the that as Mary talked about, right? There was no, nothing taken into consideration to slow down that way. So the beach zone was created, there's still water level elevation one set and ten. They piled a three foot wave on top of that. How far is that one that three foot wave going to go? So it goes all the way out to here. The law of model will have obstructions blocking it, bulk that still construction. So instead of going all the way, it may now go to here. <coughs> okay, so it may shrink a little bit. Some point it may be right up. Some may be a little in. It's our 99.9999%. Nothing is going to increase. It can only decrease. All right? That's why we want it to be conservative. We didn't want to have put out a B zone, tell someone they're in an A zone, and then when those maps go effective down during the day, then we didn't do ourselves. We built this and didn't do you any job. Mm -hmm. So if that's the way to explain it. Sorry, did I no, 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 that, that's totally fine. Uh, we're gonna have a group discussion after this session too, between sessions. So we'll let's let's revisit these questions. They're leave. really good questions. <laughs> but there's a. Uh, I just wanted to go over the actual flood study that Bill was referring to, because as you said, that the advisory switch back to audience. Uh, what Bill was saying, the advisory based floods are based on the cultural flood study that's ongoing right now, and there's gonna be maps coming out. Um, I think for Ocean County in August 2013, so this year they're going to be coming out. So it, it's important for you to know what's going to be coming with these maps. Uh, just so you know, the partnership, there's a lot of partnerships involved here. Um, we are academic partners with NGDC, uh, cooperating technical partners who work directly with FEMA. And in cooperation with that, all these, all the flood study and everything, all this information gets it's compiled and the analysis is done by a lot of different organizations, uh, primarily um, some larger contractors doing the wave modeling like Dewberry. But uh, we're working with FEMA and the NJDC to do the outreach, um, but a lot of this work is being done by the Army Corps of Engineers, um, the Urban Coast Institute, Stevens, um, NOAA, Jacques Cousteau, USGS, uh, all types of different organizations are working together to convey all this information to you. So it's a very different approach, as Bill said, than, than previously. Um, so why are we making these changes? Well, as you can see, Sandy created a lot of, wreaked a lot of havoc in New Jersey and caused a lot of devastation to your town. And the problem with that is they're not reflecting reality. The reality is these maps are 25 to 30 years old. And with current projections of sea level rise and how dynamic the shoreline is and subsidence and all these different things, having updated maps is absolutely necessary. And having them in digital formats, as I'll show you a little bit later, will just help you convey this risk in a map, a meaningful map that you can display to the public. A lot of this upgrade to FEMA maps started in 2003, and then Congress passed a law for um, $1 billion to do what's called map modernization, taking all the old, older paper maps that were effective and creating digital map copies. So all these, 92% of the nation's population, it was a huge, huge project. So all these maps have been digitized and, and into a geographic information system. And it's called map modernization. Now, how are they updated and modernized? Well, as Bill was referring to, we do newer refined analysis me methods and digital applications. And they're really helping to aid in defining the flood risk and finding flood areas. And what we're using now is something called GIS, geographic information system, GPS, and LIDAR. So GIS takes a whole bunch of different geospatial layers in a map, in a digital map, and you can combine them all to display flood risk. And that requires GPS in the field mapping and something called LIDAR, bathymetry, 
So all of these things, topography, really high resolution data sets go into this mapping. So there's a lot of science behind this map. Um, they're not just drawing arbitrary lines. There is a lot of modeling and science behind this. So what does that do for us? It increases the quality, reliability, and availability of what has the data. Now, community officials and planners, now you're going to be able to actually see the risk in a color-coded map to your community in specific areas on a map. You can even see the depth of a 1% flood in a specific area on a map. Now, building developers, that's even, it's going to be even better because you're going to be able to adopt um, building standards and how construction can affect different floods. If you're in a V-zone, how are you going to build? Now, insurance agents and lenders, online access to all this information. Now, they can serve their customers better and may change their premiums, yes, yeah, but the information is better. If you're in a flood zone, you weren't previously, but you flooded, the risk is, there's a new study is actually conveying a, a better risk data. You're going to know if you're in a flood now. That's why these, a lot of these zones are, have been expanded. Um, and why are we doing this? New Jersey gets its fair share of tropical storms and hurricanes, not, and not to mention more research, which are not on this map, and just, you know, isolated flooding events. Um, this here is Irene. Sandy is the track so new it wasn't actually on this map. But we do see our fair share of tropical cyclones. So it's very important to understand the different types of storms. And within the modeling, there's hundreds and hundreds of storms that go into these models that create these worst-case scenarios for different recurrence interval events. So what is risk? Now, this collaboration between state entities and delivers quality data, increases public awareness, and takes action that reduces risk. That's very different from what was previously done. Risk map is actually working with the communities in a very holistic approach. Because previously, as Bill said, it used to they worked in a bubble, and here were your maps, and here are the changes. So now we're actually trying to do that. And you can see that with the advisory-based flood elevations too that have been provided. So one of the things it does do, it includes the NFP mapping, dam safety, mitigation planning, and a, um, a hazard software called Hazard, which actually can model flooding events. So science-based support decisions. And what RiskMap does is take a watershed approach. So it actually looks at an entire watershed to look at all the floodplains within that watershed. So here's the cycle of how RiskMap works. You ident to identify the risk, you need to assess that risk. So that means you need to map risk data, which includes depth grids, wave modeling, surge analysis. You assess future risk. The goal measure the quantifiable risk reduction. So you communicate that risk, which is what we're doing here. And once the maps become effective, we'll be doing that as well. And once all these risk map products, which I'll talk about come out, we'll be doing that as well. And then you mitigate that risk. And what does mitigate risk? It reduces life and property, loss of life and property. So we're trying to deliver the high quality risk data. The data is what's really going to help you convey the information to the public because it's going to increase awareness. Because coming from Long Beach Island and Holgate in particular, a lot of the real estate turnover in the past 30 years has been tremendous. So a lot of people never really knew how bad it could be. And other, also, a lot of these places are second homes. So if they're not there in the wintertime, they don't know how bad a Northeaster can be. Um, 1992 comes in the market. Um, in December. So it, it's very important to, I mean, everyone's very sensitive to Sandy now because they know it happened recently. But prior to that, a lot of people weren't really sure why people had to construct high dunes. Um, I think they understand the risk now with not having a, a beach dune system or, or having flood mitigation activities to reduce risk. So benefits from risk, risk map. Increased community awareness. Now, it allows FEMA to work with FEMA to work with communities and increase risk mitigation action. Now, uh, just a quick question: What is your community risk awareness? Um, are, after Hurricane Sandy, have you been using any risk map products? Has anyone been? What's your? Do you, do you guys know what your what your community risk was before Sandy? Did you know certain areas that flooded? Did you know that anyone? <laughs> Now, how did you convey that to the community? 
prior to that? Were there any products available? Did you provide that to the community? Uh, the GI, I have GIS and I have, okay. uh, basically I have the existing overlay. Uh, okay. The, uh, Okay. Okay. What well, risk map is going to allow you to do is create what's called a risk map report and map. It's actually, you can actually provide your public, provide the public. It's actually going to show their properties. You can actually show during a hundred-year storm, standing at their property, what the steps going to be during a certain flood. So in the session, I'll show you that. This it's very cool stuff that going to really convey the information well. And you can actually see what happened during Sandy, too, if you apply, let's say, we're not sure on the numbers yet. I, I, they're not saying whether it was a 1%, 2% storm, but it, you could get a good idea of how bad Sandy was in that sense, looking at flooding in certain areas. Uh, the New York, New Jersey Coastal Flood Study. And I just want to go over that quickly, the extent and what's involved. and all the different pieces of parts that go into it. There's a lot of science, so bear with me. Now, we wanted to produce updated firms for 14, um, the 14 coastal counties. Um, sorry, New York City, and then Staten Island, and Westchester, and then actually starting in Bergen County and going all the way down to Cape May, Cape May and up to Delaware in the Burlington County. So it includes surge and flood hazard components. Now, you have to restudy all of these coastal areas. It's a lot of work, a lot of maps, a lot of analysis and modeling. So the first thing you had to do was acquire the data. Uh, one of the things that we've been using for this type of study is something called LIDAR. It's light detection and ranging. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's extremely high resolution elevation data that's collected by aerial flight. Uh, millions and millions of data points. So you can get a three-dimensional surface of an area. So you can really model flooding, flood hazards, and you can actually raise the water levels on a three-dimensional surface to see which areas will be inundated by a certain amount of flooding. And with that, we use offshore bathymetry. You combine that with topography. So you can see what waves will do coming up against the coastline, see if a, if a wave will erode a dune or go over land from certain types of modeling. So in that sense, you, you can analyze storm surge heights over, over land, um, conduct wave height analysis for flood insurance studies. So all the different pieces, parts that go into this, you assemble a bathymetry and topography grid. That's the basement. That's what you need. So create an at-surf swan grid, the grid offshore that can, it's very technical, I'm sorry, but it, it, it helps you model storm surge and waves. Then you describe recorded storms. All the storms that have affected certain areas, you can actually quantify all the different parameters that go into a wind, wave height still water elevation. And then so you model all these storms using the data that you collected so you can actually read, basically create these storms in a computer to see what will happen to the different areas today. Do you model breaches, uh, breaches uh, anything like that? How does that fit into the scheme or for the target? The way the modeling works for this, because it's such a huge region, um, the overland wave modeling one of the coastal products, which I'll talk about in session B, is what they do is they'll, they'll run an overland wave model, and if there's a dune or obstruction, if the, water, if the waves are a certain height or the water level is a certain height, they'll either have the dune erode and the waves will cross over land because it's been inundated, or it'll be significantly eroded, but it won't breach. That's, that's going to be shown as a coastal product on a map. Uh, just as a side note, the Pulse Research Center is actually doing something similar. Um, we've been actually modeling dune breaching for Northern Ocean County. I don't know if you've seen the map in the Asbury Park website, but that's some of the modeling that we've done for a 100-year event. We're able to, a 250-foot section of the beach model um, for dune erosion to see if the dune will erode or not. So that's a supplemental product that's available on our, our website that we can provide you. So just to continue, uh, we model the storm set, the historical storms, and then we determine still water elevation. And you add run up and the wave crest height, and then you make the flood map. And the basic elements. I'm sure some of you in coastal areas are familiar with um, waves and how waves affect dunes, but you do the storm surge still water elevation. Still water elevation comes from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. 
So this is the still water elevation. As the wave approaches, it has something called wave setup. So the water elevation actually rises before the wave approaches. And then as the waves break, you have something called run up. So if the wave runs up on a dune, for instance, it'll run up and it might erode the dune to a certain extent if it's coming at an angle. So if you have a, a dune like this looking north to south and the nor'easter is coming like this, it will come in, you'll have set up and it might actually cut into the dune and erode. And if you have heavily vegetated dunes in some cases, they might slump off in big chunks. You have 20 foot sparks in the dune. Um, so that's, these are all the inputs that go into the dune. So when I was talking about the dunes eroding, all of these go into that model to see if the dune will breach or just significantly erode during a 1% chance. Do you have a question? Where, where can we get the silver elevation for a specific region? Uh, I'm not sure if the still waters are available um, as a product because um, they go they get input into the model, but I believe the still water elevations are generated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they were. Do they? Okay. 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 Um, for the overland wave modeling, quite a bit goes into this, but just so you know, there's, it, it actually tracks different structures that are in the way as waves approach. So you'll have a datum of water, water level, and then you'll have waves affecting going inland. And now all these, the model includes, so it looks at waves impacting areas that are greater than three feet, and then wave heights that are less than three feet. So, and then in the X zone, that's your 500 year. So it can actually model, okay, if a wave height comes here, hits these obstructions, and three, it's less than three feet, and then um, between three feet and one and a half, and then over the less than that. Now, this is just an example of what the overland wave model does. They have all these transects going across the barrier islands. And they can actually run these storms with waves hitting these beaches and dunes using the LIDAR data. They can extract the elevations from here, so they can sit. They can see how high the waves are on a certain length along the transect. You can see that's the actual profile there. And they do this thousands of times along the coastline. So there's a lot of information that comes out of this to determine these zones. So we have the creation of the still water surface, calculation of the wave setup, the erosion analysis, the WAFIS simulation. A run up analysis, then you develop a DFIRM flood insurance study. So, and this is what it comes out to. Once you do your overland wave modeling and you develop your, your, your zones, and then this, these are what the maps start to look like. You have your zone, your BE zone with an actual base flood attached to it, and then inside here you have your zone X. Now, the limit of moderate wave action. This is something that is a non-regulatory product that's going to be coming with the RISMAX product. Um, so what the limit of moderate wave action is, it's, it's, it's a line on the barrier island where it actually denotes where there's wave heights less than one and a half, uh, one and a half feet or greater. So it's not exactly attributing to a certain zone, but some of the structures that may be in a barrier island or coastal area that may be affected by waves not just surge. So that's the basic gist of it. It's very technical, but that's the important thing to know. So if someone may not be in a V zone, but they may be in an area where there is wave activity. The zone you're in. So the V zone, A zone. Coastal A zones, yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not required in the emergency. 
Um, we have a question here. Are the modelers using the Hurricane Sandy high water mark to recalibrate their model and refine one percent chance storm simulation? As far as I know, we are not. Um, the modeling for all the past storms has been done. Um, so because to revisit that and to recalibrate the model would have to require to go back and redo all the modeling. And for such a large area, it would, it would be a lot. Uh, yeah, we'll be addressing the timelines for all the modeling and everything for the, specifically the, the base side of New Jersey, the Delaware base side in session B. Well, to what extent is sea level rise going to take into account this model? Um, as far as I know, it's, it's been a snapshot in time. At the elevation at this point. Correct. Because modeling future sea level rise is very unpredictable at this point. So, um, but it, it's much better to do it now than not do it at all and have your bat maps based on 25 to 30 years old data that's not reflecting current sea level rise. So, um, it, it, it's the best we can do at this point. Uh, just a quick group discussion, then we'll move on. Um, is your community located in the coastal area? I'm willing to bet pretty much all of yours are. Um, yeah. Um, what are the commonly mapped flood hazard zones in your area? So it's probably ZVs and A's, and I'm sure you, a lot of you, if you're on a beach in the Atlantic coastline, you have constant issues with beach and dune systems eroding. Um, and do your present maps show the Limois area? If so, has your community adopted more stringent building standards and visa? Can you just explain when you talk about the maps that were located the side of the zone? Coastal A zone? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Where you are, not going to be in the video. See, it still matters if there's wave, waves impacting the structure. So, mm -hmm. Which town are you from? I'm in West Burlington County, like in Delaware. Okay, yep. What you're talking about is this that revision process continuing longer or is this a new set that's now coming out? Um, I believe those are this it's it's gonna be based on your revisions it's Tolga, you know? A question about Blanco. You can refer your question to Tolga. Yeah, we have a set of The new LIDAR is coming. It's, it was six, as far as I know. Yeah. Not 
Um, I understand what those waves actually. Your question is why isn't the coastal A on the map, and is it going to be regulated like a V zone? Have you, have you, or are you aware that it is becoming a regulatory stand, standard in the future? The new bullet areas? Yeah. No, they're on it, but they're not regulated by flood insurance, for example. As far as? Is it just a V zone? Yeah. What are, what are you heading towards a regulatory requirement? Is it, you know, it makes kind of sense that it's, it's being beat up over and over and over, so is it heading towards that? Is it, are you talking about the space level? Well, well, actually, yeah. I respect I'm, I'm saying our insurance is going to require a big, well, that's up to the info. Yeah. I don't know about the insurance industry. I mean, at some point, they, they may, but I guess right now, you know, FEMA is the state, I mean, we'll recommending for the energy to that they don't have to. I guess the big carrot in all this is that there's like 650 CRS right in 52, and it's, it's a big deal. Another thing that, that the bill, I think the bill also, if you adopt the ADA method, there's actually 300 CRS credits for example, so if you read the coastal A and the adoption of the ABFB map is essentially 950 CRS credits. So, I mean, that's that, that, I understand. like two classes. So, so like, but, but from, from, from the emergency rule, there's been anything in there on the coastal A. So, so, right now, it's not a requirement from the state. I think the state would, would like to leave it as a community option. You know, but right now, it's just going to be hard. Right. And I understand. If you build on the quote, you know, whether that's going to change in the future. Yeah, it's hard to see. We don't have any indication that it will change, that it won't be, you know, what this is going to be. So right now, it's an eight zone. So the top of the radar that is going to change. Right. If I can speak to that, John Miller and the AFM, um, there are a lot of interests nationally to get the three foot move to the 1.5 foot. So that may be coming, but mm -hmm. not, there's nothing happening there on that. Uh, but there are a lot of moves pushing for that. As I understand, the building code recommended yeah. the actual be on standard. And when you're talking to the residents right now and how to propose a proper rebuilding, it's just that it's it's hard to uh, explain. You know, here is a here is a method you should consider doing, but you're not required to do it. But is, mm -hmm. is there is there something that you all? If it were known, this is coming down the pipe, you know, and it's twenty three years out. Yeah. That's At this point, yeah. No. Yeah. It's not imminent, but there there's strong interest in getting mm -hmm. that what you say about you know, CRS. I understand. Okay, uh, just to move on, just so we can wrap up, take a quick break. I know you guys have been sitting here for a few minutes. Um, the affected communities here, um, as we said before, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island, Queens, uh, the Hudson River Valley, and then all the coastal counties in New Jersey, stretching from Bergen all the way down to Cape May and up to Burlington. Um, for Atlantic County, I just want to give you an idea of just a quick, quick run through of what's happening. So here's Atlantic County. So the affected communities here, incorporation of approximately 59 miles of detailed riverine redelineation, 176 miles of riverine, um, I'm sorry, 176 miles of riverine redelineation, and 31 miles of shoreline that have been redone with coastal analysis. Now, the, the important thing is the, the boundaries to the DFERM maps and the flood insurance profiles have all been incorporated. And the DFERM and the flood insurance studies will be produced in the FEMA countywide format in the new datum, AVD 88. Storm surge analysis was an analysis of tropical and extratropical storms using the ADSERC model and the joint probability statistical model. Um, so the topography and the best imagery are all complete for Atlantic County. The ad mesh is completed. Statistical analysis of storms. 
are, are nearing completion, so they're not totally done at this point. Um, but the ad model modeling started in 2010. So the overland wave hazard analysis, this is, was not completed for the ABFE. So, but the field reconnaissance is, is complete. The obstruction polygon attribution is completed. And the overland wave modeling is underway. So once this is completed, then the components for the coastal analysis should be ready and then the maps can be made. So mapping partners delivering a preliminary map to Atlantic County in September 2013. Um, the project team for this was the local communities, um, the NJDP and FEMA, and the task with this was the redelineation, um, restudy of all coastal hazard zones. And then there's going to be a flood insurance study report production. So you're going to get a new flood insurance study re um, report. And there's going to be new DFIRM panels. Now, they're not just calling them flood insurance rate maps anymore. They're digital flood insurance rate maps because all the products that are displayed on the firm maps are actually going to be digital products that you can view in the GIS if you wish. Um, so the preliminary DFIRM production and distribution will be coming out. Um, here's the timeline um, for right now for the preliminary, projected preliminary map. So 2013, so we are in Ocean County, August. 2013 and Atlantic September and then Cape preliminary maps will be October. I believe there was a question um, previously about the Delaware Bay Shore. So Cape May County, that's when that would be coming in. So the important takeaway from this session is we need to take action. We need to establish community mitigation plans, um, purchasing flood insurance, regardless of whether you are mapping such a flood hazard area, because as we all know, sea level is rising. So if you improve your structure, even if you're not in a Z zone, your, your premiums on flood insurance are going to be lower. So it's very important to take convey that risk. And you need to plan before disaster occurs. You need to be proactive as opposed to reactive. So uh, Bill mentioned this website before, region2coastal.com. It's a really great resource for the local community. You should really check it out. It's where the, uh, the actual digital maps for the advisory base flood elevations are, so you can look at that. And the New Jersey mapping status, you, um, the RAP, the RAMP team is the team that's actually doing the work for the for the analysis. Um, and if you visit this site, www.rampp-team.com slash nj, the status of this flood study is on that website. So for all of New Jersey, you'll be able to check that out, keep up to date when, if anything changes with the preliminary maps. Um, and then contact information um, for the FEMA Region 2 and the NJDP. Um, if you have any questions about the NJDP, Joe Ruggieri is here. So he's the man to talk to um, with, from the state. And from RAM, Gene, um, Gene Huang. And I, with that, I think we're going to have a little this group discussion if you want, and then we can take a quick break. Um, so what are the potential effects proposed from changes in digital flood insurance right now? Example, this is a good one. Property that was in a low-risk zone now is located in a high-risk zone. So how are you going to convey that to a homeowner if they have to raise their home and they weren't in the zone? They said, I've never flooded. They can, anyone have any experience with this? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe now, maybe later. It is. It's the cost to do so. Well, a lot of the, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially on Barnegat Bay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, one of my communities uh, go with the Morgan. The majority of the homes, very few of them, which is saying that. Okay. Yeah. Is the actual location geographic spacing between the houses does not permit mm -hmm. raising the houses to a especially along the waterfront. Mm -hmm. uh, you physically have to either model the house, pick it up, move it into the street, or something like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, panic 
from Congress now. Mm-hmm. When people hear fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year flood insurance rates. Which is completely and, understandable. Uh, you know, they, but the, I, I asked someone from the, the uh, flood insurance that pro, or from the flood insurance program at a webinar. Has anyone has there been a cost analysis or an affordability analysis on it? And uh, has anyone taken into account the economic devastation that will happen in real estate values, people walking away from the business? And the response I got was it's not a concern. Well, it is a concern for me, but I don't I, I can't answer that question. Um, the cost for raising homes is substantial. It is. But if some if these people are do purchase flood insurance and can get ICC grants, from what I understand, raising homes is estimated, depending on your foundation size, to be around thirty thousand dollars or more. Eighty to a hundred. from online. Uh, what is the obstruction polygon? The obstruction polygon is using the overland wave, wave modeling. So it basically delineates the structures and the obstructions that they use for the wave. So they're actual physical polygons on a map that delineate a structure, that type of structure. So if a wave hits that structure, then it knows whether to go around it or reduce. If you guys use island uh, polygon facility and you use the modeling of this, are people going to be able to go back? Because if, if their house, their polygon wasn't affected by the sandy high water mark and you just went in and filled it and you did not, because that's the easiest thing to do, are they going to be able to go back and then file for that letter of not adjusted to get that taken out? And if so, you need an elevation. A more easier thing to do? Or is that something that people are going to look at and say yes? Even if they ain't not a so we're going to let you come out of that. Because it looks like this year you can fill. And, and that would be the case. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's no more questions. Uh, why don't we take a quick break and then we'll come back and reconvene in about 10 minutes. 